So the topic of today, uh, today's design corner is different ways to start your game. Uh, this was inspired by, and I removed the uh, comment or the post from my OBS sources, so I can't pull it up easily. Uh, but there was a comment by somebody on the Savage Worlds subreddit, r Savage Worlds, asking if it was okay to begin their game with all of the players being related, right? I think they specifically said brothers and sisters. Now, my immediate response to that was, well, of course, so long as your players are bought into it, why wouldn't you start them all knowing each other? But then I remember something that we often do when we're working on a product is basically give the GM allowance, give them permission to do things in their game. And that's, that's a lot of what goes into a tabletop book because some people don't have a lot of experience with TTRPGs, so they don't think, oh, I can do whatever I want. It's my game. Um, other folks don't think to just do it in that way until it's written in front of them and presented. And other folks are just, they, they want to stick to the rules as much as possible because they want it to be fair. And so if we don't put it in the rules, then it isn't fair game. But I've started games in all kinds of different ways, and I personally often find that having a impetus for start actually works way better than just kind of the meet in, meet in a tavern or in a caravan or whatever. We're a bunch of strangers that come together. Now, there's one thing I want to say at the beginning. There's absolutely nothing wrong with having all the players meet in a tavern. I think we can run into some issues where when you kind of just push the players out into center stage and ask them to describe their character and to do a little bit of role play and just interact with other people in the tavern, they don't necessarily have a impetus for that, right? So I would recommend, if you're going to start in a tavern, unless there being a mystery of where your players are starting is a big portion of your game, or at least that first session, tell your players, hey, we're going to start in a tavern. And so what I want you to think about before we ever get to the game is... What am I going to say? What does my character look like? What's my character? Why is my character in that tavern? And so that way they have a prompt, because an essential part of a TTRPG is improvisation, right? That's all the mechanics are geared around. How do we introduce some randomness and improvisation in the game? Well, same thing this year. Or, sorry, I just saw Saragar's comment and read later this year, and that overrode what I was actually saying. Uh, same thing with the prompt, you know, you're in a tavern, but your players aren't necessarily improvisational actors, they're not necessarily people that even have ever worked or touched or done anything creative. And so if you're going to ask them to do something creative, giving them the prompt beforehand so they can think about it a little bit, super helpful. So... Uh, Abuela Saragar said, Later this year, I'm going to start a side story of my main campaign in which characters are all new recruits of an adventuring company founded by the player's main characters. So to some extent, the players can portray both new characters and their mains as mentors. Uh, that's something that I've experienced, it, not, not exactly in that fashion. I have played in a D&D &D campaign where very, uh, the, actually the, the baked-in impetus, right? Because this was a very medieval D&D &D game. It was, uh, I think, a 3.5 game. And the expectation was, if your character died or got too old to continue adventuring, you would play that character's heir. And so you're playing over the lifespan of a noble house, generally speaking. So you would, that would give you impetus for, okay, well, I need to secure a marriage and have heirs and send those heirs to be trained by other knights or go to wizard schools or become members of the clergy, whatever it might be. So that way I had players, I had characters to play as down the line. Um, so something like that, uh, we could do an entire design corner on generationality in games, as well as kind of what you're also uh, talking about there, which is kind of having a B plot in your game. Uh, flow radical. What about characters that have worked together before, such as a group of mercs or the crew of a ship? Absolutely. If you, honestly, I personally find if the entire group doesn't know everybody, each, one another, having people be in pairs and trios, depending on the size of the group, is super valuable. Uh, for instance, I was playing in a Pathfinder 2E game, right? And I, I do this both as a player and as a GM. I was playing in a Pathfinder 2E game, 
and I was playing this cleric who had been in the crusades that this uh, the GM setting had against against demons and devils, and he'd been in like six, seven, eight crusades. And so he tangentially knew all the other player characters because at some point or another, they had either served in similar areas or directly together during the Crusades. And so that was a awesome way to kind of hook everybody in. And so knowing, knowing people beforehand, absolutely. Uh, and Abuelo Saragar, I mean, that it wasn't a birthright setting. It was a, it was a custom setting, but birth, birthright absolutely did some of that. Um, I... Not a thousand, uh, not a thousand percent familiar with birthright. I'm more familiar with by reputation, having read stuff. I don't think I've ever played in a birthright game, uh, but that's just you know one of the the flavors of fantasy. Yeah, like like Colin uh, ten twelve underscore said, using a session zero so that uh, characters have at least one tie or relation or rival with another player character. Uh, I, again, this this well actually we'll we'll kind of get into converging threads. Uh, but there is a uh, kind of rules light system called Technoir, and I, I, the thing I steal constantly from that system is their mechanics for generating a noir story. The players have lists of connections, and then there's a booklet of events and bad guys and items, and you randomly generate based on these tables how are these things connected, or not that they are connected, not necessarily how they're connected. That's where the GM comes in. But so let's go ahead and start with the first item on the list, the hot start. So the hot start, you will also hear folks uh, refer to it um, either. I, I don't know, it, it's one of those terms where depending on who you're talking to, it has different meanings. Uh, I generally think of the hot start as, as being the in media res in, in, in the moment start. So the action has already happened. We're just dropping your players in. Some folks will say that, that a hot start is more about uh, introducing stakes and then turning those stakes to 12. I think that's just, are you starting in media res or a little bit before in media res? But this is a super useful tool, especially if you have new players, especially if you're playing a game that has tactical combat, right? So the thing that your players most likely have some handle on are the mechanics of the game. So, for instance, in Savage Worlds, we've got the act, uh, you know, we've got the action card initiative. We've got your multi actions. We've got the powers that you can use. We've got attacks, damage rolls, all that stuff, right? Your players have some grasp on that because those are a discrete list of rules that they can engage with and begin using immediately. So, if they're new, they probably can utilize the rules of the game but they probably aren't super comfortable with the role-playing side. The I'm going to be in character. Anyway, when I say role-playing, I'm not necessarily saying, you know, speaking in an accent and saying everything as your character would, da-da-da-da-da. Some of the best role-players I've ever played with are not folks that do voices or anything like that. They just think of a lot about how does this character think differently than me. And oftentimes, they don't even speak in character. They tell me what information their character transmits and how. That's all completely valid. What, however your players want to role play, let them. And I, I mean that in manner, not in tone. Tone is something that you actually as the GM have to have to have a bit of control on because you don't want somebody making other people at the table uncomfortable or kind of derailing the tone of the game that you're going for. But so the hot start requires a lot less role play and is focused on the mechanics at the very beginning, starting in a battle, starting in a chase, something like that where the tension is already there and the stakes are already set up to be quite high. So I've, I've done this in a couple of different ways. The kind of most basic level is describe, you know, I, I had an instance where my players were guarding a caravan as it was moving through a dangerous piece of wilderness in a fantasy game and they were attacked by goblins, and so I narrated everything up until the point where they rolled initiative, and then they rolled initiative, and that was the start of the game. And the players got to find out, oh, you're playing a fighter, you're playing a spellcaster, you're some sort of uh, priest, all through the mechanics and the spells. I'm wearing this and that and this. The players all see, because of how your mechanics are utilized, what you're playing.
Uh, so from Havenheart, my group was related by a legendary bard that was very friendly with members of their family and all called him uncle. They're human, a couple of half-elves, and a furbolg. And instead of the adventure starting the tavern, the tavern was the adventure. A absolutely. Hav having connections is great. Having something that connects everybody. So I I've done that, right? And that's just straight into combat. And then once the players have finished combat, right, then they, then they have something to talk about. Oh, we've just been attacked by all of these goblins or orcs or whatever they might be. This pack of, of ravenous wolves that wouldn't otherwise normally attack a caravan full of people. There's a problem that is very clear that they have to solve or a mystery, right? Why did these things attack us? Or how do we prevent them from attacking us again? Another useful tool in this is having that combat happen and then not having NPCs run away, because it's in most games it's very difficult actually for a uh, character to run away and get away and not get killed by the party, but narrate the fact that there's movement in the trees and you can hear distant war cries and whatnot, and so there's danger lurking about, because that gives your players a problem to solve. How do we get this caravan to our destination without getting killed? Because your players have something to talk about, their characters have something to talk about, they don't have to think, okay, what what's important for the other players to know about my character? How should I describe them? How do I set it up so that they understand who this person is? And have, giving them an issue to address, for your players that are really into role-playing, they're going to think, okay, how would this character solve this problem? Okay, let me go in that direction. For your players that are less comfortable with role-playing, they're just going to think, how do we solve this problem? How would I solve this problem if I was in this scenario? And especially for newer players, that's a completely valid way for them to start going about uh, trying to role play. Um, I see a question from the Grasshopper. How commonly do you see instances of making sure that hot starts cover all the bases of the engine, as a lot of people are likely to be coming into Savage Worlds for the first time because they've heard of Pathfinder? Well, I don't think that the start of the adventure needs to cover all of the mechanics. Uh, this Having an adventure that hits all of the mechanics one by one and really does a slow and steady introduction is something that is you really have to put a lot of design thought into that. And, and for example, in Hollow's Last Hope, while it's not explicitly a this is your first foray into Savage Worlds adventure, we did build in a lot of things that allow for that, right? So, for instance, instead of having random encounters to make the world feel dangerous, we've got all those random encounters modified to be structured. So, for instance, if I was doing this a hot start with Hollow's Last Hope, I would probably say, okay, well, I would narrate how people started getting sick in town and which person who mattered to that player character got sick or how that player character became embroiled in this plot. And then I would probably even kind of skip past the initial conversation you have with Laurel, where she tells you what ingredients you need, and instead start the players either on the way to or somewhere in Dark Moon Vale. And then have them be ambushed by a bunch of giant flying mosquitoes. And that encounter we've designed so that way it really teaches, it's really good for players who aren't familiar with Savage Worlds to learn how, what does attacking look like, what does dealing damage look like, what does soaking look like. The stakes are as such that the players are unlikely to be wiped out if they have a bunch of bad rolls and aren't playing optimally. And there's enough enemies, right? Two per player is, is this is one of the things I was talking about before we got uh, dropped because of the internet. Uh, that encounter's gotten even more changes since we talked about it last week. There's two creatures per player, so every player is going to have an opportunity to take out one of those creatures. It's very unlikely that they're all going to get wiped out before you actually get there. So we teach, you know, there's how you fight a bunch of extras, and then we have a later encounter where it's going to be some extras and a wild card, so that way you can start to see, the players can start to see, okay, now there's a, a more dangerous type of foe called a wild card, and how do we identify those? We want to make sure that we're in, encountering them differently, and so on and so forth. But I don't think that first encounter should teach you all of the mechanics. It should be pretty low, pretty simple, especially if most of your group are new players. The players should just need to roll to hit, deal damage, and that's it, and they can get through the encounter. It's then over time, as those encounters kind of become the norm and that they're, they're good to go, then you start adding in other elements like wild cards or 
situations in the encounters, right? So for instance, you know, a great thing that I always love to do is it's one thing to have to fight a group of villains just one-on-one -on -one in a battle scenario. It's another when there's a whole bunch of civilians that the players are inclined to protect and keep from dying. Uh, from uh, Dersham80, I like using a dynamic task as a hot start sometimes. The whole uh, tied up with a bomb going off type deal or locked in a jail cell with an opportunity to escape. Absolutely, that also works. I'm kind of, I generally, I often have a lot of new players in my groups, so I'm very focused on how do we just get you to understand a TTRPG and wrap your head around that. But if your group is more experienced and you don't need to teach them the mechanics, something like a dynamic task is perfect for a hot start. Because also, with a dynamic task, you're thinking about what skills do my character does my character have? What would they do in this situation? And that inherently pushes you towards that role-playing notion of what would my character do in this situation, right? If I'm the illiterate barbarian, I'm not going to read the runes on the side of the collapsing door as we're about to be squished by the Indiana Jones spike trap. I'm probably going to try and like force it open or jam a mechanism or something gets me to the notion of what would my character do versus what would I as the player do. Flow Radical likes to use the session zero to get people familiar with the system, like running a simple combat scenario. I, that's basically what I'm describing. I just like, if we're going to meet to play, then we should play something. I generally don't do session zeros. Generally speaking, it's an asynchronous thing. Um, I'll, I'll send out an email or something. We'll talk about you know what to expect from the game. Make your characters individually often or maybe in pairs, depending on what's going on. And then when we get to play, because that's always the hardest thing with every group, is let's schedule a time and actually play at that time, at that date. Let's get playing. It's straight into the encounter. And so that way it's not something that is this, you know, let, let's have this teaching, you're hitting the training dummy moment, but actually have you learn over the course of gameplay. And depending on the game that you're playing, if you're starting as novice, low-level characters that don't know anything, the fact that the player is learning what's going on at the same rate as their character makes those two things line up, which uh, the other folks at Peg will make fun of me for, for bringing it up, but that's what we call ludonarrative harmony. The game and the experience are the same. So the other thing that, uh, the other kind of way I've done a hot start, uh, this was for an Edge of the Empire game, which, big shout out, if you want to look at a adventure that's really well designed for here's the slow roll of uh, implemented mechanics. Again, Hollow's Last Hope is a, an adventure for first level players, for first level characters. It doesn't mean it's an adventure for first level players. We've made a bunch of allowances, but the original adventure wasn't a let me teach you how to play Pathfinder, so we didn't make our version a let me teach you how to play Savage Worlds. But Escape from Mashuta for Edge of the Empire is a great example of this is a adventure that slowly introduces new mechanics, especially for a system as weird to most TTRPG players as the narrative dice system is. And it takes you step by step introducing new mechanics and that's how you begin. And their version of the adventure begins with the players running away from the bad guys into a cantina. Uh, I wanted to make it my own, so instead of running Escape from Mashuta, I had Escape from Actar Station. And the very first thing that happened to the players is they ran into a cantina in this space station. I described how each one of them had come to this station to meet with this crime boss for one reason or another. One of them was an assassin who had been paid for a job and had come into conflict, and now this gang leader was sending thugs after her, and she wanted to put a stop to that. Uh, another was a smuggler who the captain of the ship he was on had taken their last haul and run off, and so now that gang leader was looking at him as the person who had to pay off that debt, so on and so forth. Things went poorly. I didn't d describe how things went poorly because I wanted that to be something that the players could come up with and figure out, you know, which one of us made this go from a tense negotiation where we were all meeting this crime boss for various reasons to they are in a fight. They were complete strangers otherwise. And because they all had the same goal of we just escaped to here, we need to get off this station. And the only people we know we can trust who aren't in some way either going to sell us out to this crime boss on this station or are directly working for the crime boss or will just have nothing to do with us because they don't want any trouble are the people we're around. And so that was the important part of this one is I gave the players a reason to be together 
and to only be able to trust one another. It's something that, generally speaking, when we're playing, unless you go in with the notion of this should be a adversarial game, we want to have a lot of party conflict, I want to think that maybe my other party member is going to stab me in the back at any moment, which is an entirely different game to run and probably a, could be a design corner in its own, we generally want the players to have good reasons to trust one another. So that way, we don't have this adversarial relationship between the players. So making it so that the only people you can trust are the other people who also pissed off this bad guy is a great way to do that. Uh, from Haven Hart, a valid complaint I received from a player before I started this campaign was there's nothing to glue the group together. And giving them a headquarters at the beginning handled all that wonderfully. So providing the group a tangible link or goal goes a long way. Absolutely. Having that thing that all the players are working towards is especially useful. Also, depending on your style of play, that might be the only reason why this group comes together. Right, if you're playing, I, folks call it older school D&D, &D, but I, I just think of it as uh, a playing, playing a game with a lot of downtime. Your players come together to do some sort of adventure, and then they split off to go and meet their own goals. You know, the fighter wants to become a baron, the wizard wants to create this tower and to study magic, so on and so forth. Those are the things that drive the individual player and allow them to have a goal for their character. But then we have the shared goal that brings us all together, so that way we're playing together. Uh, so Colin1012 brought up a good point. I tend to ask players for a wish list, things they want or want to play out with those characters. So uh, I, I got the chance to play, this was in the before times, before the pandemic. Uh, I got a chance to play God's War with John Wick uh, of Legend of the Five Rings and... Seven Seas, and House of the Blooded Fame. And he said something that, that's stuck with me in the, is it two years since there, there's this, this throwaway conversation? But he mentioned how he didn't really know how to design, or not, not how to design adventures, but how to traditionally design adventures anymore. Because the thing that he always does is he looks at his players' character sheets and says, w what's written on here, right? Th this is the stuff that my players want to do. So, you know, he was talking about how one player was playing a cleric and had a spell on there that made it easier for them to deliver a child. And he was like, well, I, I, I wouldn't write that into a macro adventure. That's, that's not something that is super useful for most people. But absolutely, in my game that I'm running, obviously this was important to this player because they, they thought, oh, I'm going to take this, this spell. And if it was important to that player, it should probably show up in the game. And so he said, absolutely, there's going to be a point where there is a carriage that's being attacked and the party has to defend it. And there's a woman inside and she's giving birth. And so the cleric has to birth this baby in the middle of combat. And so that is something that I think universally everybody can utilize is what's on your player's character sheet is the type of stuff that they're interested in. Especially, you know, some games, it's very combat focused. You know, a lot of your D20 games, it's... Uh, based on a war, it, it's chainmail is where we all come from with a lot of the D20 games. And so that tactical combat is, is the core. But when you have a game where there's a lot of other options, especially, then looking at what's on the player's character sheet is something that's super valuable to understand what type of adventure should I be running. And that can often play into the hot start, right? Imagine I've, I've chosen this spell. I didn't think it was going to come up very likely. And then the hot start is, we're regarding this caravan. This woman started giving birth. We had to stop the caravan. And now the rest of the party is trying to stop the attackers from murdering everybody while I'm delivering this child. That's a great hot start. People are going to remember that. That's kind of the other thing about the in-media res hot start beginning is you want it to hit. You want it to be impactful. You want it to be very dramatic. And you want to make sure that the stakes are really high at that beginning point. So A, the players don't have a moment to stop and think, why are we doing this? And so it's a super memorable moment. Whenever my players talk about that game, where they had to escape that station, that's the thing that they talk about, right? It was the fact that they were immediately in hot water. They were, you know, out of the frying pan, into the fire. And we didn't have that slow buildup of how did you get into the frying pan? What caused you to jump out into the fire? We started with that jump into the fire and got to the bits that people actually want to play. So... Uh, absolutely, Abuela Saragar says that uh, to some extent this is on the players. Yes and no. As the GM, it's our job to make sure that we make it dramatic and tense and that the players have some stake in it. 
if we can't provide that to if we can't provide that spark then our our players aren't going to be engaged but depending on the veterancy of the group right if if you if your group's play a bunch of tabletop rpgs then yeah you can o- start offloading some of that work onto your players because they should be more comfortable with it and it should be something that they start thinking about but generally especially for new players you've got to provide those sparks otherwise they're going to kind of sit in the back and not really think about what to do and be a very passive player, which isn't a bad thing. But you want passive players to be passive because they're audience members and like seeing all the cool stuff and just being there for the experience. You don't want them to be audience members because they don't know how to engage with the game and start playing. Uh, so that's kind of the, the, the in-media res hot start. The big takeaways from that are make sure that the, the stakes are high, drop them immediately into utilizing whatever the main mechanics of the game are, right? From a lot of TTRPGs, it's going to be combat. Um, but if it's not, if it's a more narrative game, then using the social conflict rules or whatever it might be. You know, if I, I, if I was starting a fourth edition game, I'd probably immediately start with a, uh, a skill challenge. Uh, or, you know, like a dramatic task in Savage Worlds or, or just straight up combat in Savage Worlds, uh, uh, social combat. I, I love our social combat rules. So maybe even starting with that, right? There's already some tension there. But so we've got stakes, we've got conflict, and the players have a goal that they can immediately move towards. If they don't have that goal, they'll resolve whatever initial conflict there is and then not know which direction to go in. So the next start type of a game I like to do, and this is a lot more work on the GM, but I like to use converging threads. So for instance, I am in the, still in the process of running my playtest for Hall is Last Hope, and the way I started that game is I, I think a pretty standard way how a lot of folks will start that uh, Hall is Last Hope, which is let's spend a little bit of time with each individual character introducing how they relate to somebody in the town. So, for instance, I had a halfling monk who was kind of this wandering, drunken master style person. And so his best friend, and also, I I should note, I asked the players beforehand, how are you connected to Falcon's Hollow? Because that made my job easier, right? And also let them be involved in the creative process. And so the thing we came up with was he's got a drinking buddy. And so one of the dwarves who lives in town, who works for the logging company, is always drinking with him and they're, they're good friends. And so they, he comes in to the tavern where the drunken master has already started his uh, daily uh, libations. See, is talking a little funny, seems a little bit off. Maybe, maybe he's already started to drink. And then halfway into the second drink, c- starts coughing up this, this black bile and collapses. And so the tavern keeper says, hey, you should take your friend to the, the herbalist, Laurel, because he looks sick. And he needs somebody to take care of him. Well, so I gave the player... So we had a connection, right? There was, how is this player connected to this town? We role-played through a little bit of that connection so that the player had a bit of a sense of what was the personality of this character, why does my character like them, and then I gave them a goal, right? That's going to be a thread that keeps coming up, is giving the players a clear goal based on whatever start you have. Uh, oh, yeah, a... Uh, I, I just saw from Wayland Wasaragar. Yes, the cast of Star Wars Rebels did do a stream of playing Escape from Ashuta. Uh, actors playing TTRPGs is always uh, always a ride to see. I, I, if you like that kind of stuff, I could recommend it. But so we've we've given the player here's, I've involved you in the creative process of who is this connection. We've role played through it so that way you have a bit, little bit of this this interaction. So that way it's not just. I've told you you like this person, but I've role-played them in such a way that you like this character, and then I've given you a goal. Uh, uh, that that could be a, an entire uh, an entire design corner of itself of how do we make players like the NPCs we present in front of them. A lot of it comes from knowing your players, uh, but three kind of quick s- things that you can always do to make your players like an NPC. Have the NPC give the players something. So it could be as simple as, in this instance, he bought a round of drinks for the drunken master. Uh, it can be as complex as giving them a magic item or a whole bunch of gold or something for whatever reason. Have them compliment the player in some way, 
right? So talk about, in this instance, what a great friend that the drinking buddy was and how he's one of the few people that actually seems to get this dwarf and to actually understand why he drinks so much. And then the third one is to, and, and this is the hardest one, this was the one that you have to know your player the most, but just pick out some personality traits that you know that player likes and give it to that character. That requires you to really know your players, uh, so depending on your mileage might vary with new groups. But so then we, you know, I give him the goal, right? And once he had the goal, we cut from that player's perspective and we went on to the next player. And so then there was another uh, player that was a elderly cleric who was going out of the cloister for the first time and was looking for information on the store of in ruin. And it happened that his nephew lived nearby and so he was sitting down and his nephew was hosting him and giving him some dinner. And then things progressed and the nephew was sick, right? So having those interactions gives your player a reason to care about that character. So that way, the impetus of the adventure, right? You need to get the ingredients for the antidote super quick. Otherwise, people are going to die. It gives the player a reason for, to care for that, besides the fact that I told you that that's going to happen. And then I gave you a goal, right? Get this person to the herbalist. Or for the, the drinking buddy, in the case of the... Uh, the nephew, because they were a healing cleric, he was able to stabilize him, but he needed more supplies if he was going to take care of his nephew for any length of time. Oh, go talk to the local herbalist. And that's the big thing with the converging threats, is you have to, before you get to the session, think about where is my player going to start, right? What hook is it going to be? You could even do this, you could mix the hot start with this, right? You could have one player start in a fight, or maybe one or two or three par portion of the group start in a fight, another portion of the group start elsewhere, and so long as you give them some sort of intro, so they have a little bit of chance to play their character, a little bit of chance to roleplay, that's the, the, the carrot, so that way the players don't get bored while everybody else is having their turn. And again, I recommend keep each section to probably... I wouldn't go past 20 minutes per player, and that that's that to me is even a long period of time. But if you're having a, like a long conversation, it might take that long. If you're doing combat, it might take that long, depending on the game. But give them a little bit of action so they can play their character, and then give them a goal, and that goal needs to intersect with everybody else. Now, there's a kind of a natural inclination to be especially clever with how those goals intersect. You know, okay, well, this player needs this thing, so they got to go talk to this person. Or, oh, well, well the player, they, they're going to be asking after, and so everybody's going to direct them to this one character because they know this one character has that information. Well, in both of those instances, there's a step between the, thi the player, the creature, whatever, the character, the item that I need this player to go and seek, the, the location I need them to go to. There's an intervening step between where I need them to go and where they started. And that intervening step can get you into a lot of trouble. I need to find X item. Well, your player might just not take the same clues and hints that you give and say, oh, this is the person I need to go to. So instead of saying, hey, you need to find this item, and the only way to find that item is to talk to this character, skip the intervening step and just go straight to, you need to go talk to this character. They have the thing that you need. And you can, depending on, you know, it, that could be a, a, a role to, for knowledge. That could be a, another NPC tells them. It could just be the GM saying, your character already already knows this, right? Maybe you're familiar with the place that you're in. You already know where you would go to get this. Have that be the same point. And so every player gets a different hook that leads them into the same character. Now, when I say different hook, also resist the urge to be overly clever there. Because if you make that hook too important then they're going to just try and do their slice of whatever group thing needs to be accomplished with these converging threads and then back out, right? Having somebody's nephew become sick is one thing, right? There, there's especially a nephew that you don't really know. It's, it's still family, so you probably want to take care of them and you're healing clerics. So you probably should do the right thing. But if it's your child or significant, your character's child or significant other, then the only thing you're going to care about is that and that's going to lead you to kind of meet that thread, try and get through it as quickly, and then pull you away from the rest of the group. And that's the point where I see a lot of games kind of die at that point of, well, now it really makes sense for this one character to no longer care about the rest of the stuff that's going on because they've accomplished their goal, and their goal is way too important for them to care about this other stuff. That's something that you generally want to try and avoid. So make sure that 
it, the stake is stakes are there, so it's dramatic, but not so high that it causes the party to then break up. And whatever those threads converging are, it can be, you know, we have to talk to this character because they've got information. They, in the instance of Hollow's Last Hope, we have to get this item from this character or we need this cure. Uh, it can also be, we all want this same thing. And whatever that thing is, right, The sometimes it's a MacGuffin, sometimes it's not, but the object... The only way for us to get it is to go and do this thing, and we can't do that by ourselves, so we need to do it as a group. This is actually really great for if you want to run a more adversarial game where the player's going to be stabbing each other in the back. We all need X item. We can't get it our, on our own, but only one of us can have the item, so how does that shake out? That's a great way to do converging threads. And then the third type I wanted to talk about is starting as an organization. And uh, organization implies structure, but... It doesn't have to be, we're all members of the FBI. It doesn't have to be, we're all members of the same adventuring party. It can be, like in the original Reddit thread that uh, inspired this topic, we're all members of the same family, right? We're brothers and sisters, cousins and uncles and nephews and aunts and so on and so forth. But there's some sort of overlying structure that sits on top of our group dynamic that is the reason why we're together. So that can be, you know, a, a very common start in Pathfinder games, and this is one of the suggestions that we have in Hollow's Last Hope, is you could start as you're all members of the Pathfinder Society, and you're going to Hollow's Last Hope to do your final confirmation mission. The players already have a reason to be together. They already have a reason to know one another. Uh, this is especially useful if you have players that know the mechanics really well, and so when they hear, oh, you're, you're a fighter? Oh, I know exactly what a fighter can do. It's one thing to say, okay, well, I'm a my character's reasonably experienced to know what the fighter is. It's another thing to say, I know exactly what that other player can do because I've fought with them before. It really helps have the groove gel together. This is also a great place where asking the players, how, what do you think of this other character, right? And ha sitting with them down in pairs and trios and figuring out what is the network of relations. So I ran a game where all of my players started as the different retainers for a noble house. So we had the spy master, we had the uh, house surgeon, we had the captain of the guard, and the uh, bodyguard to their noble lord, as well as the castellan. And something I did before I even asked the players, hey, this is how your characters are related, was I created this little diagram that showed the relation of all of the roles that they could fit in. And something I recommend if you're doing an organization start, especially if there's going to be titled slots that the players fit into, is make sure there are about two to three options per player. So in my instance, I think there were about 13 or 14 total roles that they could slot into, and I had five players. So that way they got to choose between, okay, I like A and I like B, so I'd be fine with either one of these. And that way if players happen to want the same thing, hopefully you have uh, a, enough lack of overlap that everybody gets to play their first choice. But it also gives the GM a whole lot of hooks for these are NPCs that I can create and define their relationships. But so I had these about 14 different roles, and then I said, okay, when the Castellan is doing their job, they often have to interface with the treasurer because the treasurer holds the purse strings and they have to talk to them to hire new staff, to increase pay, to deal with payroll, all of those different things. And the Castellan also has to rely on the uh, captain of the guard because they don't have control over the military forces of the house and often their job is going to require coordinating with them. And then when I go over to the uh, treasurer, the treasurer has two people that they're regularly interfacing with that aren't the castellan. And so it's kind of, uh, it gives you this kind of weighted, I need you, but you don't necessarily always need me. And that helps really define relationships within an organization. Especially if you're going for the, my organization is actually a, a disparate group of people working towards a common goal as opposed to something like a family. And this is especially useful when you have those roles filled in with NPCs. Because now they have these shifting ranks of priorities. I like you, but I need to do this thing for the treasurer because that's much more important than the task that you're asking me to do. And that's a great place to introduce tension within the organization that isn't conflict. 
Because when you're doing an organization start, one of the things you have to be careful about is if you introduce conflict within the organization, that's when organizations tear themselves apart, right? If there is a traitor and you're having to hunt down who is betraying our house, right? Do we think Lady Jessica is the one that's going to lead to the fall of House Atreides? Or do we think that perhaps it is Dr. Yui who's actually the traitor? In that, in that example in Dune, spoilers if you haven't read Dune, uh, the house was on the verge of, without anybody, uh, without the Harkonnens attacking, starting to tear itself apart because of the suspicions it had within its own members. That's conflict. We don't necessarily want conflict, but we want tension. And a great tension is, I want to do this thing for you because we're working towards the same goals, but I view this other thing that I have to do as more important. So I'm devoting resources over there. And generally speaking, so long as you have a reasonable persuasive argument for your players, or your players have reasonable persuasive argument for the other players, they'll understand, okay, you're not trying to screw me over because you're angling for power or you don't like me. It's because you've got a job to do, and your job doesn't always transition with mine. And so that, I think, is a great way to make sure that there, you can have tension, right? There's drama. There's how am I going to accomplish this? Can I rely on this person? No, I can't. I have to rely on this other person that maybe I don't like as much, but they've got the resources I need without introducing conflict that's going to split up the organization and make it very factional. Now, of course, you can always do that if your game is about how this organization crumbles and goes apart. But if not, you want to give the, reason, the players reasons to rely on one another, that's where those relationships come in. If I need you to do this thing because I don't have the power to do that on my own. But we also want tension. So now there's maybe that thing that I could do for you is not my number one priority. Uh, from Havenheart, I'll probably have my group be citizens of the town and let them find their path through the adventure. That's, that's always a, a great way to start. It depends on your players, right? So... If your players are generally speaking pretty good about the, that unwritten understanding, which actually it doesn't have to be unwritten. You can always say, hey, folks, just so you know, we're running this adventure. Do me the favor as the GM and kind of generally go along with the flow. You can always just tell your players, have that conversation with your players. More communication is not worse. But if you already know that your players are inclined to do that, then just kind of plopping them down and letting them find their own way to the adventure is pretty valuable because it makes them feel like they're in charge of their own characters and it's their decisions that led them to wherever they were going to go. But again, I, I always run for a lot of new players, new to either the system or to TTRPGs in general. And so I like having that extra bit of structure of a clearly defined goal because it gives that player somewhere to go. And so that's kind of the thing that is true across all of the different starts is ultimately you have to give your players a goal. Right. Everything else at the end of the day is really just set dressing. It's giving your players a clear, defined goal from the start. Escape the station. Discover, uh, find the ingredients for the cure. Deal with this threat to our organization. All of these instances, it's all about giving your players a goal and then just giving them a reason to care about that goal. Whether or not it's because they're in personal danger or because they have a relationship with another NPC or because it's when you were like, hey, what do you want to play? And they said, oh, I want to be the house guard, the captain of the house guard. Th they were excited to do that. So they want to protect their lord. So they're going to work towards that uh, goal of the organization. So long as you give them that goal and the clearly defined, this is kind of what you need to do to get there, you're going to have a pretty solid start. And then from there, you can start layering in B-plots and things like that uh, and give your players more options to role play and such. But so long as they have that goal, there's something that they're going towards, and you're not going to have sessions, most likely, where you're just kind of sitting around, not sure of what's going on, nobody are making decisions, nobody are going for things. So to kind of sum up everything, it's give your players a reason to be in conflict, to have a little bit of drama and tension at the start, give them a goal that they can work towards, and then either give them or let them figure out how their characters working towards the same goal all interlink and begin play together. And that is kind of any time I've started a game or seen somebody start a game following those principles, it's worked out. Every time I've seen a game, well, not every time, but most of the time I've seen a game kind of collapse and fall apart is because we didn't have that shared goal. 
we didn't have that initial tension. We didn't have that drama that somehow glued our characters together. And as always, these are just some ways that you can do it. I'm, I'm never saying don't do it another way. And for some groups, not having a goal might actually be the thing that really works for them. But especially for new players, I find this is kind of the best route to go in order to really get them starting to engage with the game on the game's terms and to think about how their characters would act and to make active decisions as opposed to just sitting back and be passive. So I don't see any new questions, so I feel like I've done a relatively good job of explaining the kind of the different starts and the different tools that I've used and have found to be very successful. Uh, yeah, Abuelo Saragar said, a shared enemy that the entire party wants to get revenge on slash bring to justice is always a solid hook. Uh, there's, I, I don't know that we could ever create an exhaustive list of all the goals and hooks. Um, it's as varied as, as all the goals and hooks that people have in real life. Figuring out which one is kind of more catered to your players is a super valuable thing, and that's a conversation you can have with them before you even start planning a campaign. So I'm not sure what the topic for next week will be. Uh, part part of the point of Design Corner is also, uh, as we encounter problems on the development side, I can talk about how we broke those down. But right now we're kind of in the wrapping up phase on a bunch of stuff and, and the, the starting phase for some other things. So we're kind of in this, this weird in-between point. We could always talk about B-plots. Um, that's, that's super useful. That's, a, uh, again, another not necessarily a design specific uh, topic, but rather a kind of macro GMing topic. Uh, maybe uh, in, I think about an hour, yeah, about an hour, we're gonna be starting our, uh, this week's dev play test of Rise of the Rune Lords to do some encounter testing. So maybe there'll be some problems that pop up there that we'll talk about next week. But regardless, uh, always feel free to come up and even if it's a question that's kind of a little bit off topic, Generally speaking, um, if you have a question, bring it to the design corner and we can always talk about it. I, I, we don't have to be married to just the one topic, though we definitely should talk about it. And as always, if you want to show up 10 minutes beforehand, we start the stream, give folks a chance to filter in. And if you have any questions th or things that you want to talk about that otherwise wouldn't fit the corner, feel free to come by early and just chat and hang out. Otherwise, I think we'll leave the topic for next week to be a mystery until probably about Tuesday, uh, where if you're already signed up for the Pinnacle newsletter, then I think you get a notification there because it's part of the news blast, uh, as well as keep an eye on our various social medias as uh, I often pull topics from there uh, based on what the community is talking. And also we'll probably uh, t mention at some point what next week's Design Corner will be about. Um, and oh, I saw a question. Let's. I, I haven't read it, so I don't know if I can go into it. Abuelo Saragar. Uh, I'd like to know about the design process of creating magic items, since that is something for which there are not currently a lot of resources. Let me think about that, and I don't know if I'm the best person from the Savage Pathfinder dev team to talk about creating magic items for Savage Worlds. But I might, maybe I'll have a guest on, or maybe they'll do the design corner. Uh, there's no reason that it just has to be me. But we'll put that in the hopper and figure out what the topic for next week will be. So until then, uh, I hope you folks got something useful out of this corner. As always, feel free to reach out uh, across all of the PEG stuff. You've not just got me as a resource, but you can jump on our forums and get answers directly from Clint and Shane and the other folks at Pinnacle. And just remember that we are always a resource here for you folks.